Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And welcome to our great church, Living Water Community Church. My name is Rick Thompson. I'm the privileged pastor here. And again, I want to welcome those who are joining us online as well. We are in the middle of a series, or we actually we just started a series called The Parables of Jesus. The Parables of Jesus. And we know that when Jesus walked on this earth, he taught. And we know that about a third of his messages, a little bit, maybe a little bit more, when he taught, he illustrated using stories. He, and we said a parable last week in its most basic form is, a, is an earthly story with a heavenly application. An earthly story with a heavenly application. Or, or, or a little story with a big meaning. Amen? And, and, so, and so when Jesus um, walked this earth and and his, his disciples, and he taught, his, his disciples were curious about the fact that you know, he taught in ways that a lot, of his, a lot of the teachers of the law and those other people didn't. They just kind of put it out there. And so they took him aside one day and basically asked him, why do you teach in parables? Why, why, why are so many stories illustrated? And he answered the question in Matthew chapter 13, verse 10. He said, his disciples came and asked him, why do you use parables when you talk to the people, and he replied in verse 11, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom. You are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. To those who listen, someone say listen. listen. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, someone say not listening. Not listening. <laughs> Even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. He says, that's why I use these parables. For they look, but they don't really see. They hear, but they don't really listen or understand. Verse 15. For the hearts of these people are hardened, and their ears cannot hear, and they, and, and they have closed eyes, so their eyes cannot see, and their ears cannot hear, and their hearts cannot understand, and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. How many know this world needs healing? Come on, somebody. But in order to get a healing from God, you got to humble your heart. you got to humble yourself to receive from, from Christ. Jesus said the problem with the world is they have hard hearts and spiritually deaf ears and they have closed eyes. And again, that was true 2,000 years ago, and I promise you it's still true today. I mean, we saw that in last week's message called The Good Soil, where Jesus described four types of people whom the, the word of God went out to. And, and the basic message was everybody heard the word. Come on, somebody. But not everybody received the word. Amen. Only one-fourth of the people who heard the word received the word. And, and I gave them names. I said, Harry Hard Heart and Shallow Hal and Distracted Doris. I'm so sorry, Miss Doris. I said, I, I had a Miss Doris come up to me after service. I'm Doris. I said, oh, no. <laughs> she said, but I'm not distracted. I'm here every Sunday. God bless you. I said, you know, we, we're going to change the name. We're going to change it to Distracted Desiree. Any Desirees in here? I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, she <laughs> raised All right, we're just going to call it D. The point is, she was distracted, and uh, other things just kind of crowded out the word, right? And you remember Jesus' response to, to Martha, who was also distracted. He says, Martha, you're, you're, you're busy about, you're distracted about a lot of things, but there's only one thing that really matters, and Mary has chosen that one thing. And what did Mary choose to do that Martha didn't do? She decided to sit and listen to Jesus. Turn to somebody, look at me, I say, you got to listen. Come on, somebody. You got to listen. And, and, and so Jesus tells us, he describes for us the benefits of, of people who listen, the thing that would happen to them. He said, but blessed are your, ear, your eyes, in Matthew 13, verse 15, for they see in your ears because they hear. The Bible says you're blessed. If you come to the place where you start to listen to the words of Christ, my, my, my sister-in-law recently blessed me, speaking of blessings, with a box of, of seeds. And she gave me, I mean, I mean there's got to be hundreds of them. There were sunflower seeds, I don't know if you can see these, and carrots, and, and radish, and 
and garden beans and oh, who loves watermelon? Come on, son. Watermelon seeds and pumpkin seeds and there's lettuce and peas. I don't really like the peas, but, but all the turnips. But listen, it's food, right? And there's parsley. And so she gave me all these seeds. Now, it, it sort of reminded me of an article that I read not that long ago. And this is what it says. It, it says, Norway has opened a doomsday seed vault in the Arctic. The vault dug deep in the permafrost of a remote mountain is located in Svalbard, some 620 miles from the North Pole. The purpose of the frozen vault is to protect samples of the world's seeds from global disasters, natural or man-made. It can store up to 4.5 million seed samples, and it's a backup to the world's other 1,400 seed banks. And that's, of course, that was Associated Press. Folks, the world has the wisdom to guard against natural uh, disasters w using seeds, knowing that life springs from them. Come on, somebody. And so they put all these things because they know that if something happens, they're going to need to get seeds because they know that life springs from them. And one of my spirits says, but they can't even recognize life in the womb. Come on, somebody. Amen. They can't even recognize life in the womb. But in the same way, listen, we should guard the spiritual seed of God's word. Amen. Amen. Because it's the source of our spiritual life. If you're going to walk around and ignore what God is saying, you're doing it to your own detriment. If you're going to walk around distracted all the time, you're doing it to your own detriment. Because you're not guarding the source of life itself, the seed of God's word. Now with that in mind, we're going to pick up where we left off last week in Matthew chapter 13. Because Jesus didn't just tell one story, he told a bunch of stories in that chapter. And so we're going to go to one of the stories he told, another one. And I call this one, good seed, bad seed, the choice is yours. Good seed, bad seed, the choice is yours. And, 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 and if, if, if a good seed represents what I just picked out, seeds that are useful, come on, the watermelon, and even sunflower seeds. I mean, anyone like sunflower seeds? Come on, I like that. Uh, uh, broccoli and turnip and all these things are food, right? These are things, are seeds that produce good things that we can consume. If, that, if, if a good seed is something that produces things that we can use, then what's a bad seed produce? Things that we can't use. And so we're going to call them weeds, right? <laughs> Have you ever noticed that no one, ever has, no one packages weeds and goes out and sells weeds? Weed seeds. This, this is seeds for your lawn. You can put this on your lawn and, and maybe you can get some weeds in your lawn. Now, no one does that. You can't go to Home Depot or Publix or anywhere. Where are the weed seeds? I need that. Except the funny seed, the other, the other weed that they, they, they did there. God help, us when that, God help us when that gets legalized down here. Because you think we got a lot of drunks on the road, it's going to be worse when you got drunks and high people on the road. Come on, somebody. But no one packages those seeds. Yet, come on, somebody, don't they just show up in your yard? My wife said that the other day. We were in the backyard. She was doing her spiritual grounding. You know what that is? You take off your shoes and your socks and you go sit out there. And she's looking at our backyard which, by the way, we get treated, you know, we weed and feed. You know what weed and feed is? We, we have a company, Scots, that come out because I'm not, I refuse to be that guy. I refuse to be the one guy in my neighborhood with the worst-looking lawn. I don't have to have the best-looking lawn. I just can't be the worst-looking lawn, right? And so I have this thing, weed and feed, right? But yet, what's popping up in the middle of my lawn? Weeds. Weeds that look sort of like, you know, like, can we show up some of these weeds? Weeds. Weeds, all different types of weeds popping up all over the place. And nobody goes out and buys them and says, you know what, I'll just make my lawn look like garbage. The weeds just show up whether we want them or not. Come on, somebody. And it's especially frustrating when you're paying a lawn service so that it doesn't happen. And so when it, when it concerns weeds, Jesus had something to say. And, and, and in Matthew chapter 13, verse 24, he told us a story about wheat, things that are, produce good things, and weeds, things that produce something that people don't really want. He says in verse 24, 
He says, here's another story Jesus told. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night, as the workers slept, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat, then slipped away. When the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. And the farmer's workers went to him and said, Sir, the field where you planted the good seed is full of weeds. Where did they come from? Verse 28. An enemy has done this, the farmer exclaimed. Should we pull out the weeds, they asked. No, he replied. You'll uproot the wheat if you do. Let both grow together until the harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, tie them in bundles, and burn them, and to put the wheat in a barn. Now Matthew dropped down to verse 36. He tells us the interpretation because, again, disciples were hearing him teach to the masses using these illustrations, but when he got by themselves, if they didn't quite understand what he was saying, they point blank asked him, what do you mean? What are you trying to say? And Jesus gives us a play-by-play. He gives us a blow-by-blow. It almost reads like the scroll of a movie at the end. You know how it says this one does this, and this is responsible. This one's in that role, and and the scrolls go up. That's kind of how it reads. In Matthew 13, verse 36, it says, Then leaving the crowds outside, Jesus went into the house, and his disciples said, Please explain to us the story of the weeds in the field. Jesus replied, The Son of Man is the farmer who plants the good seed. The field is the world. Someone say the world. And the good seed represents the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people who belong to the evil one. The enemy who planted the weeds among the wheat is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the harvesters are angels. And so according to Jesus, listen to me, everybody has a role to play. Everybody's in this somewhere. You and I are in this picture somewhere. Come on, somebody. That's why I said it's a big, it's a little story with a big meaning and a heavenly application. It's not just so we can hear it go in one and out the other and say, oh, that's a nice story. No, you better look for yourself in these stories. You better decide which one, which who's Jesus talking about when he's talking, when he's telling these stories. He goes on. Verse 40 says, just as the weeds are sorted out and burned in the fire, so will be at the end of the world. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will remove from his kingdom, some would say his kingdom, everything that causes sin and all who do evil, and the angels will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then the righteous will shine like the sun in the Father's kingdom. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. And so now before I go into any further explanation of the story, I want to... Let me just say that to be sure, if God or Jesus or the Bible sees fit to repeat something, that means to say it again, it means he really wants you to take note of what he's saying. He don't have to say it again. How many times did Jesus have to say something for us to pay attention to it? Turn to someone and say, just once. But if he says it again, how many of you know you should pay attention? You should pay attention to what he's trying to say because he wants us to know it. It's something if, that, that he wants us to know. How many of us have kids? Come on. All right, so I have kids. I have grandkids. I have kids. My mama is here. I am a kid. All right? I, I've been a kid as well. How many of us have, how many of us work someplace? Come on, if you work someplace. How many of us are employers? You, you're bosses. You, you supervise people. All right, so I have been an employer and I have been an employee as well. I've been on all sides of the the spectrum, all right? So if I was a parent, or you as a parent, you turn to your kid, you say, please clean your room. And your kid says yes, and goes off and does their own thing. And then a day later, or two days later, that room's still not clean. What do you do? 
I know some of you just ignore it. Don't, don't do anything. I wouldn't, that's not me. I'm not, because that wasn't my mama. I couldn't go outside to play or nothing until the room was clean to her satisfaction. Can I say that right? To her satisfaction. No, no, no. This was her satisfaction. So we'd sit there. My buddies would want to come out. You coming out, Ricky? You coming out to play? We're going to ride up bikes. We're going to play some bars. You ain't going nowhere till your room is clean. All right? I'll clean it later. No, you ain't cleaning it later. You cleaning it before you leave. And so I'll be, oh, oh. And then listen to me. It could take me five minutes or five hours. My mama was not going to let me out of that room. And then sometimes I say, okay, I'm done. And then you remember what you used to do, mama? She'd come in. What'd she do? She would look under the bed. And then she'd do what? She opened the closet. And the things are flying out the closet. And the things are rolling out the bed. From under the bed. And she said, clean your room. I know, I know. So it wasn't like my mama was telling me twice. She was telling me one time, and she wouldn't let me out the room until it was done. But I'm aware that that's not how it works in most houses. Most of the time, you would tell them, and then it wouldn't get done. So you would do what? You would tell them again. Now, the second time you tell them, I mean, would it be the same as the first time? Come on, somebody. Uh, the second time you were maybe asking, you would tell them, but it was like an ask. The second time, you're a little bit more sterner, right? Because with that second, or if it is a third time, there is an or else involved. And depending on what parent you are or what your parenting style is, it would depend on what your or else was. I know what my or else was. But yours might be different. If you're an employer and, or you're an employee, and the, the employee tells you that you need to come in at 9 o'clock, your day starts at 9 o'clock, and you walk in at 9.05, 9.15, 9.20, 9.30. And your employee might call you and say, yes, maybe there's some misunderstanding, but the, your day starts at 9 o'clock. And that week you walk in at 9.10 or 9.15 or 9.30. The second time your employee has to tell you something, what's going to happen? Come on, somebody. You might run into the or else, Right? Or else. And so Jesus, he paints a picture, and he's laying out before us an end time scenario. And he's saying in that scenario, there are wheat and there are weeds. And he says there are very different outcomes for both of them. And as, and as if to drive home the point, listen to me, he doesn't just leave it for you to hear it one time. He tells it to you a second time as if to tell you or else. If you ignore what I'm telling you, folks, there's an or else coming. Let him who has ears, let him hear. Sometimes we need repetition for the point to be made in our hearts and in our lives. Come on, somebody. And so in Matthew chapter 13, verse 47, he gives us basically the same story in a different form. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a fishing net that was thrown into the water and, and caught fish of every kind. And when the net was full, they dragged it up onto the shore and he sat down and he sorted the good fish into crates, but threw the bad ones away. Now, now when it says throws the bad ones away, it doesn't mean back into the sea. Understand that. He explains that in verse 49. That is the way it will be at the end of the world. The angels will come and separate the wicked people from the righteous, throwing the wicked into a fiery furnace where there will be, help me out somebody, weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then he asked this question, do you understand all these things? And they answered, yes. They said, we do. And so Jesus, with these two simple illustrations, he's painting a powerful picture of principles that we should not ignore. If you ignore it, you do it to your own detriment. Don't shoot the messenger. 
Five points to ponder and to prepare for from this parable that Jesus has given us. Number one, first thing I think you should know is that this is God's garden, God's world. This is God's garden, God's world. Matthew 13 verse 24 says, the kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field, in his field. And he told us whose field it was. The, the field was the world. Come on, somebody. Please, please, please don't ever get that twisted. Don't ever get that misunderstood. This world does not belong to the devil. This world does not belong to Mother Earth. This world belongs to Father God. Come on, somebody. Amen. It belongs to God. And I didn't say it. The Bible says it. Psalms 24, 1, 1 through 2. 1, 1 and 2. It says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Amen. The world and all its people. Help me out, somebody. Amen. Belong to him. For he laid the earth's foundation on the seas and built it on the ocean's depth. Come on. I, I just want to hear you guys say it. One, two, three, read Psalms 24 with me. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. For he laid the earth's foundation on the seas and he built it on the ocean's depth. This world is God's world. The rest of us, we're all just kind of passing through. Hear me. I know we want to buy property, and we want to put our stake in this, and we want to do this. And men, men just like to build kingdoms, and countries like to build areas. Any way you slice it, when it's all said and done, it's all going back to God. Come on, somebody. Because it's his world. It is, it's his world to do with what he wants. Jesus replied in Matthew chapter 13, verse 37, he says, The son of man, Jesus replied, he says, is the farmer who plants the good seed. And in verse 38, it's not up there. It says, and the field is the world's. So, so who is the son of man? Come on, help me out, somebody. So Jesus in his story is referring to himself. Say to himself. It's a reference to Christ. He's the son of man. And we know that. It's not, in, it's not on your outline, but you can write it down, check, check it later. John 1, 1 through 5, and John 1, 14. John 1, 1 through 5, and John 1, 14. This is what it says. I want you to listen. It says, in the beginning was the Word, capital W, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, the Word, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. You remember all the things that were made in the beginning? Come on, somebody. The heavens and the earth. The, 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 the light, says, let there be light, the, the, the trees and the plants, the seas and, the, and people. Everything was made through the word. Come on, somebody. Amen. Who was in the beginning with God. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was the life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Verse 14, and the word, capital W, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Come on, somebody. Who, who is the word that he's, he's, help me out, somebody. Who is he talking about? Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. He was there in the beginning. He, it was through him that God created everything. Come on, somebody. And so when he says the son of man is the farmer, he's, he's referring to himself. This world <laughs> belongs to God, and it's going back to him. Come on, somebody. Don't, don't confuse that. The second thing you need to know is Satan is an interloper. He's an interloper. Definition of an interloper is a person who becomes involved in a place or situation where they are not wanted or considered not to belong. And so in that story, Jesus said in verse 39, he says, the enemy who planted the weeds among the wheat is the, he identifies me, is the devil. And so shortly after God created this world, 
we know biblically that the Bible says that Satan fell from heaven. And where does he pop up? The first place we see him pop up? In the Garden of Eden. And in the Garden of Eden, what is he doing? He is the deceiver. He's a dev devilish, demonic in interloper. And, and, and what is he doing? He's doing evil. And he was quite successful right from the word go. He pulled a whammy on the human race. It wasn't even two people. And, they, and immediately we we're off to the races with his foolishness. And, and, and we know what happens when, when the devil shows up. Because the Bible says the result of it, through his deception, sin enters the world. And with sin, the death process began. And when Jesus showed up, he says, I want you to know that he's still in this world some thousands of years later. In John 10.10, 10, he called him the thief. Remember that? He said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the MO of the enemy. At the end of the day, even though what he shines in front of you might glitter, might make you feel good for the moment, once he has his hooks in you, listen to me, it, 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 he might offer you an apple, but I'm telling you it's a poison apple. Come on, somebody. He might offer you something that looks delicious, but in the end, it's going to have a bite. And, and it says, he, Jesus said, the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. But he said, but I have come that you might have life. And that life to the full. We know what it looks like when he shows up. I used to work in the jail system as a, as a nurse, as a psychiatric nurse. And when I was working at BCI, the woman's prison, there were several mugshots on the walls. And I would see it from, from time to time. The jails would have it too. And basically, they would have people who would come in with multiple incarcerations. And they would have their first shot on the wall. Maybe they just started doing drugs or just started doing what they were doing. And it would be this normal looking person. Then they'll show the next one. And the next one. And the next one. And every single shot down to the last one, you, the, by the time you got to the last mug shot, because of what they were doing, they got incarcerated again for the sixth, seventh time, they looked like totally different people. As a matter of fact, I went online. I said, I wonder if I could find something like that online. I went ahead and Googled it. The, 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 this is what I, come, what, what I came up. You see the first one? She looks normal. I think this was a mess. What's that? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. 14 incarcerations later, she looks like the walking dead. Let me, give me the next one. These are just before and afters. Before, after. Before, after. Before, after. Before, after. Folks, it's, it's frightening. It's frightening. And how did they get from those first pictures to that last one? They embraced something. So they embraced the evil in their lives that took over their lives. When Satan shows up, that's what happens. Come on, son. And it may not be instant, but folks, the death process has started in your life. How many know that that goes against God's original intent for everybody. And so Satan is not a creator. He's a perverter. And so he'll take what God has done, and he will pervert it. And that's the end. And, and, when, and by the time he's done, <laughs> the things that he's operating on becomes, becomes used or used up. And in severe, in severe cases, I mean, they can't even walk. They... they hold a job, they can't hold no jobs. They, they become useless in their abilities to get anything done because the devil and their strongholds have taken over their lives. Like weeds and bad fish or fish that have gone bad. It might be good fish that have gone bad. You understand what I'm saying? And so it kind of reminds me of a situation earlier this summer where we went on vacation to the West Coast and we went to a place called the Red Coconut RV Camp. And as soon as we got out there, we'd go there every year for a couple of days. But this year was different because as soon as we pulled in, normally the place is packed. It's not the big grounds. It's right there on the beach. 
usually it's packed. This year, there were spaces everywhere. I'm like, gosh, what is going on here at the Red Coconut? Wouldn't take me long to figure this thing out. Get out. As soon as I get out of the car, I am hit with a smell. What's the smell? Dead fish. I'm smelling dead fish. Okay, well, maybe that'll change in the next few hours. Maybe some dead fish washed up. It'll wash out. Got, got unhooked, got settled. My, my daughter came with me, my son-in-law. They got unhooked, got settled. But as I'm walking around, I'm starting to have, like in the back of my throat, there's something going on in the back of my throat. I'm hearing the, the few cars, the people walking by, <coughs> and I'm starting to think, what is this? I, this is exactly what I thought. I thought there was a chemical spill in the ocean. I thought there was a chemical spill. And so I'm like, something is going on here. Something is going wrong here. We need to find out because I don't have allergies. So for me to be getting affected with, with whatever's going on, there's some kind of caustic something in the air. And so we decided we're going to go to the management. They were, they were already gone. First thing in the morning, we, we show up. They said, oh, yes, there's a thing, thing, thing called red tide going on. I said, red what? <laughs> I had never heard of a red tide. Red tide is when an algae bloom, well, let me look it up. I looked it up. It's a common name for a phenomenon known as algae bloom, large concentrations of aquatic microorganisms, which is caused by a few species of dinoflagellates, and the bloom takes on a red or brown color. Red tides are events in which eustarine, marine, or freshwater algae accumulate rapidly in the water column, resulting in coloration of the surface water. So can, can we get a picture of the red tide? And so it might look like that. It could be brown. And I said, okay, so what does that mean? Well, it wasn't one or two dead fish that we were smelling. The next morning, because we got in the lake, went out to the beach, and there were miles and miles of this on the beach. For as far as the eye could see, and some lady came and said, yes, there's a whale down there somewhere. This thing blooms in the ocean. The fish or the aquatic light swim, swim into it, and they die. And next thing you know, they're being washed ashore. Nothing can live in it. Worse, they said it can affect the smell, the, the gas that is kicking off. People are fill, the hospitals are filling up. How many know that we weren't staying on the ocean <laughs> with a chemical release of red tide in the air. I had my grandkids there. They both have issues. One has sun, sun sensitivity, skin issues. The other one has respiratory issues. I said, babe, we're going to have to figure out plan B because we are not going to sit here and end up in the hospital due to this event. Come on. And so... That smell of the fish, remember last week I talked to you about the squirrel? squirrel? How many of you know multiply that by? A thousand. That's what it was like out there for that. Now, the effects of a satanic influence on God's creation, listen to me, is like drugs on a person's mind and body or a blooming red tide. It just kills everything it touches. Come on, somebody. Now, can I tell you the only cure for a spiritual red tide in people's lives, the sin, is the pure red blood of Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. And the good seed of his love and his grace that God offers to every single person who would come. My pastor used to say, Jesus is the, Jesus is the only one that has the ability to take a black heart, dip it in his red blood, and you can come out as white as snow. Come on, somebody. Amen. To God be the glory.
The earth belongs to God, you need to know that. And Satan is an interloper. He's just here to cause problems. And he will take what God intended for good and he will try to drag it off into something bad as well. We need to be careful. Number three, concerning that, the Bible says the good soil, the, the, the good people, the bad people, the wheat, and the weeds. He says, for now, he says, I want you to let them grow together. Let them grow together. Now, someone might ask why. I'm going to tell you why. Because God doesn't want, <laughs> he told us, the good wheat to be accidentally destroyed along with the bad ones. Now, let me just say that again. Especially when wheat and weed are small, it's really hard to tell what's the difference. It's really hard to tell. You might think you're pulling up one, and you end up pulling up something else. And so we need to be careful. We need to be careful as a body of Christ that in our judgments and our assessments, that we, are, we, we, we judge according to what God sees. You see, we tend to judge according to what we see. We look at a kid or a young person, and we will say, that's a bad seed. And we'll immediately start treating them like a bad seed. And the problem with that is you don't know if they're a bad seed. They may look like a bad seed because of the behavior that they're doing right now. Come on, somebody. But you don't know what God has in store for that person. See, God doesn't judge by what we see. God judges according to what will be. And that person may be a screw-up today but they may be the next world evangelist. Come on, somebody. They may be the next missionary. They may be the next prof, pro, prophetess uh, that God raises up. They may be the next voice of the Lord, it, it, but, but you're just judging by the fact that they look like a weed and they act like a weed and they're, back, and, and they're doing certain things. Be careful. You may see a mess, but when God, when, when God is done turning their life into something beautiful, their mess will become a message. Come on, somebody. And it reminded me of the Apostle Paul, remember? Yes. He was a mess. Yes. And he thought he was doing God's will, and he was going here and there, and he's doing it for God. And, and people were afraid of him because he was persecuting the church. He was a religious terrorist, a, a murderer. And God slapped him down one day. Come on, somebody. Yes, and spoke to him. He says, why are you persecuting me? And from his back, he said, who are you that I'm persecuting? He said, I'm the Lord. And it's hard for you to kick against the goads. And now get up. And, he, and when he got up, he was a different person. Come on, somebody. But even when getting up and he started preaching the Lord Jesus, people didn't want nothing to do with him. Not initially, because he was such a rascal and a knucklehead beforehand, it, it, took, it took him a while to figure out he had come to the right side. Now, a lot of times, again, we will make that judgment. And sometimes we will judge wrong, even when they're acting poorly. It doesn't mean that, that God, see, God will see the future in that person. And God says, no, 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 don't pull him up. See, you're going to pull up the wrong person. He even told his angels, come on, somebody. Amen. He told his angels, don't touch them until the harvest time. If he tells his angels not to do it, come on, who are you? And who am I? He said, let them grow together. Does that make sense? Let them grow together. Number four, you need to hear this, and we're coming to a close. The good news it's very good. And the bad news is very bad. The good news is very good, and the bad news is very bad. The good seed, good fish are collected, and they're kept as things that are valuable. Remember? Take the wheat and put it in the barn. Take the good fish and put them in a crate. They are being kept as things that are valuable. 
The bad seed gets burned. Matthew chapter 13, verse 43. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom. And he said it again. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. The weeds and the bad fish that are collected and sorted are separated. And the Bible says they're burned. They're burned. And the angels will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 49. That is the way it will be at the end of the world. The angels will come and separate the wicked people from the righteous, throwing the wicked into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let him who has ears to hear, let him hear. And here's the kicker to the whole story. You get to decide where you go. You choose. You choose. Jesus asked them in verse 51, do you understand all these things? And they said, yes, sir, we do. Understand what? Listen, listen. 1 John 5, 11. And this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life. And this life is in, help me out somebody. This life is in his son. Whoever has the son has the life. Whoever does not have God's son does not have the life. In all these stories, you're going to hear a common theme. Good soil. Bad results. Wheat. Weeds. Those who will listen. Those who won't. Good fish. Bad fish. Wicked. And the righteous. Folks, he gives you two choices. Those who have the son. And those who do not. Folks, he says that there's coming a time when all of it's going to be wrapped up. He says, I'm going to let them all grow up together. This is my world. Angels, don't mess with it. You let the wheat grow with the weeds. They all have an opportunity to come under the righteousness of me. But at the end of the age, that's going to happen. There's going to be a division start taking place. He says, the word's going to go out to the angels of the Lord. And the angels of the Lord, he says, harvest, it is harvest time. Now both are going to be harvested because it's God's world. This belongs to God. Both will be harvested. But there will be a separation that takes place. Come on, somebody. To those who are righteous and have responded to the grace of God through his son, Jesus Christ, he says, I call you wheat and I'm going to take you and I'm going to bring you to be with me. He said, for those who are unrighteous, who have rejected me, who have, who have found every reason not to listen and not to submit and not to serve, he says, there will be a separation. He said about the fish, I'm throwing them back. But he doesn't mean throwing them, throwing, he said, throwing them away. He, said, I'm not, he doesn't mean throwing them back into the ocean. No, he says, for, for the wheat and for the fish and, and for all those things, there's going to be a fiery furnace. And he says, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth and Jesus said it in his word it's not his will that anyone should perish but everyone come to repentance let him who has an ear to hear listen for God so loved you that he gave his one and only son that if you believe in him you will not perish but have eternal life 
God loves us. And what he did to show his love for us was the sending of his own righteous son to pay the ultimate sin sacrifice, to pay a price that we all deserve. Did Jesus sin? Did Jesus sin? No. He was called the sacrificial lamb who takes away the sins of the world. And so God's answer to the interloper was to say, you know what? We ain't going down without a, without a fight. You came in to mess things up, but Jesus says, I've come to pick things up. And, and that, that, that he, is the, he is the one who will bring life. And so Jesus came into this world and he says, he literally, he literally he did, no, did no sin. But he says, I will, take, I will pay the sin price of the entire world. And he stressed out both his arms. And he died. And he didn't do that for himself. He did that for you. And in paying that price, listen to me. God says, if you put your faith in what I've done through him, I will not count your sins against you. That all your sins, past, present, and future sins will be forgiven. But you have to humble yourself and repent. He said, but if you reject the one gift, if you look at Jesus Christ and manage to walk away, ignore, or flat out reject him, you have rejected life itself. He who has the son has the life and he who does not have the son does not have the life. You are running hard through this life and you're trying to build a kingdom unto yourself and your bank account's getting bigger and your portfolio and maybe your land that you own is going from this to this to this and you got cars and houses and 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 Jesus said it just like this. He says, what does it matter if you gain the whole world and in the end you lose your soul? You have lived a short-sighted life. You've lived for just this part of your life, which is just now. And the Bible says, listen, you, we, we all have an, a soul that's going to live forever somewhere. You have an eternal soul that lives forever somewhere. And so you are either going to live and play the long game because God is not against riches and, and things of this earth. He said the earth is the Lord's. He's, he's, he's not against you having those things. He's against those things having you because they're idols and they're excuses. And the choice is yours. Do you have the Son? Have you asked Christ to be your Savior and your Lord? If you haven't, why? Jesus, why do you teach in parables? He said, because there will be those who will listen and more will be given and those who refuse to listen and even what they have will be taken away. Folks, this ain't that complicated. I'm going in the listening category. Oh, you pay for my sins? So I don't have to pay for my own? Now, unless you, again, get this thing twisted, I, I don't know, I'm going to get you out of here. I started with my friend from last week. I shared how I went to his house, and I said there's a little bit more to the story, even though he declared himself unworthy at the beginning. When I started talking to him about Jesus, 
he came back at me and he said, well, I'm not, I'm not a, that bad of a person. I said, do you mind if I, ask, if I ask you just a few questions to see if that's true? He said, no. Mind you, he's on his deathbed. I said, I don't know how you go from saying you're worthless to you're not that bad of a person, but let me just ask. I said, have you ever told a lie? Yes, many. I said, what do you call somebody who tells lies? He said, a liar. I said, have you ever taken anything from anybody else that doesn't belong to you, no matter how small? He said he didn't. Never? I said, okay, so if you had, that would be called a thief. How many times do you have to steal something to be, to be, to be called? Just once. I said, have you ever hated anybody? He said, yes, I do. Jesus said, hatred towards someone is the spirit behind murdering someone. I said, have you ever used God's name as a common curse word? He said, yes, I have. I said, the Bible calls that blasphemy. I said, have you ever looked at someone with lust in your heart? He said, no, I haven't. I said, bro, <laughs> you told me what you did. He said, okay, I have. I said, who hasn't? I said, in just a few questions, you have admitted to being a, a liar, a blasphemer, a murderer, an adulterer at heart. And if God were to judge you by that standard, would you be innocent or guilty? He said, guilty. And I said, if that were the standard, God was going to determine whether you go to heaven or hell, where would you go? And all of a sudden, he said, I'd go to hell. And I asked him this very next question. I said, Jeffrey, does that concern you? And he said, yes, it does. I said, you know what God did so that you and I wouldn't have to go to hell for our sins? You see, we're not as good as we think we are. We're just not. I can go down that list and most of us would fail. Most of them. Yes. Have you always been, I didn't ask something, but have you always treated your parents honorably? The Bible says, honor your father and your mother. How, who can say they've always honored their parents? I'm not even going to lie. My mom is right there. <laughs> who can say that they've never taken anything? They've, they've always done the right thing. Who can say that? No one, only one person. Jesus. I said, you know what God did so that you and I wouldn't have to go to hell? He said, what? I said, he sent his one and only son. For God so loved you when I said his name. And I'm saying that to you and I'm telling that to those who are watching me. For God so loves you. And I love that he loves you, but I'm really stoked that he loves me. Of course, he included me in that. For God so loved Rick that he gave his one and only son, that if I believe in him, I will not perish, but I will have eternal life. And the moment I believe and make my confession, listen to me, that's the moment that God reckons to me righteousness. He forgives my sins. The Bible says he casts them from the east, as far as the east is from the west. He takes them and he throws them in the sea of forgetfulness. And he declares me righteous, not because I'm good, but because his son is good and his good son is good in me. And that moment I say that, I have the son. And he who has the son has the life. But if you manage to keep rejecting him, Come on. you are presuming on the future. And Jesus didn't say it once. In the same chapter, he said it twice. He said, there will be wheat and there will be weeds. There will be good fish 
and there will be bad fish. And he says, and the choice will be yours. But at some point, it's all going to be over. And that trumpet call will send out. And he says, I will dispatch my angels. And you are gonna, you're going to fall into one of those categories. And there will be a separation that takes place. And one will go on to righteousness. And you will shine like the glory, like the sun. And one is going to go into a fiery furnace where he said there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You ever thought about what would make someone gnash their teeth? This is why. Because the reality of the moment is going to hit them. And they're going to remember every single time that the Spirit reached out to them. Through their friends, through their family, even in a message like this, because there'll be those who hear this message and they're just going to walk out and reject it. I pray they don't, but they will walk out and reject it. It's going to come to remembrance. And it's going to be an oh snap moment. It's, I'm too late. And eternity will be forever. And you choose. And so, as we come to the close of our service today, I believe God wants to save you. Through his son, Jesus Christ, he will never force you. You will ask him or you will reject him. And then God will be your judge. If you've not yet accepted Christ as your Savior and your Lord, and you would like to, it would be my privilege and my honor to lead you in a prayer of commitment to him. I'm going to ask everyone to bow their heads, close their eyes. And if that is your desire, to say, I choose Jesus, I choose life. And if you're not sure and you want to make sure today, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, you just slip up your hands. I see your hand. Is there anybody else? Keep it up. And if you're watching online, Just slip up your hand as well. God sees you. I don't need to see you. Can you pray for me today? I see your hand back there as well. I see your hand. I see your hand, brother. I see your hand. Anybody else? Don't let the moment go by. God is calling you through his son, Jesus Christ. Okay, you guys can put your hands down and say something like this from your heart. It's not any magic. It's just understanding the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and that this message is for you and that God's heart toward you is for your good and his glory. So say something like this from your heart. Say, Heavenly Father, I come before you today and I thank you for what you've done for me through Jesus to dying on the cross, to paying for my sins. I acknowledge that I am a sinner and I need a savior. And Jesus, you are my savior. Come into my life, come into my heart. From this day forward, I will do my best to follow you. Fill me with your spirit with your power and with your love. Tear down anything in me that doesn't belong to you. Change my heart. Change my mind. In Jesus' name. Now stay there. I'm going to pray for you. Father, you saw the hands that went up. I pray, Father, that, you, that today wouldn't be the end of a journey, but the beginning of a long and lasting journey. Fill them with your spirit. Give them the assurance of their salvation. 
Begin to reveal yourself to them. Give them a hunger and desire for your word. Help them to understand spiritual things. Continue to bless them so that they can continue to go from blessing to blessing to blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.